Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, let me quickly introduce us on the stage today. My name is Andreas Stolzenberger. Um, I've been with Red Hat for six years now. I work in partner enablement, so I do technical trainings with partners on cloud and infrastructure products. Originally, my colleague, Markus Koch, should have been here because he's the SAP specialist who actually did a lot of work of what you're going to hear today. Uh, with me on stage is Thomas Bludau from SVA, one of our partners, and he actually did most of the work that's behind those slides. So he's going to talk to you uh, for the next 50 minutes or 40 minutes yeah. uh, about what he did. So just a quick question. Um, we're going to talk about Ansible automation for SAP HANA installation. <coughs> Who of you is familiar with the SAP products and what they do? Just a little bit. Who of you knows HANA? Okay, not all of you. Then just for a very brief and quick introduction. Uh, SAP, a German manufacturer, they create a lot of business applications for critical enterprise resource planning and management purposes. Just as an example. If you go into your local BMW dealer and order yourself a new Series 3 BMW, what will happen on the IT side is that in the back end, the ERP system from SAP is going out and plans the whole production of the car uh, in its workflow. That means it will say, okay, first Wednesday of May, this car is going to be manufactured in Munich factory three, room 25 or whatever. So to get it done, I go out to the partner system of uh, Brose, which is another manufacturer, and say, give me the cabling for that car two hours ahead before the production to that location. So all the logistics and everything is done. So this is a, a very complex piece of software. You might have heard of the term R3, which is the whole package. Uh, um, R3 NetWeaver was the full name of it, uh, which has been in the market for a couple of years. Now, in the past, SAP was based on just a SQL database like DB2 or mostly Oracle. And it was running on Windows, it was running on AIX, it was running on HPUX, wherever you could think about it. Now they're going the next step, and SAP HANA basically is a new database underneath all that um, ERP CRM system and HANA there's two stories about the name one says because the, 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 the boss of SAP is his name is Hasso and they say it's Hasso's new architecture that's why they call it HANA but in the real time they, they call it a high availability and performance uh, analytics database so the basic thing is HANA will be the basic and the only accepted database underneath the next architecture which is then S4 and in addition to that, the new versions of SAP will only run Linux. So they quit support for Windows, for AIX, for all the other stuff. Um, and there will be two Linux distributions supported, one of them SUSE and the other one as well. Um, HANA, the problem with HANA is it's very fast because it's an in-memory database. So everything is stored in memory. And that makes it a little bit complicated uh, to get it installed and running because they use the memory differently than other applications do. So they need a lot of modifications to the operating system uh, and the system settings before they actually can run the database correctly. And SAP, since it's such an enterprise critical application, the manufacturer requires you to go to a verification process for your full installations. And if you don't follow all the steps that they require, this, this environment does not get supported. And that also goes deep down. They, they look at the NIC and the network cards and the chips of your network cards that you have in your server. If this is not a, a, a serviced and a supported version of a network card, you cannot run this environment in production supportively. So you have to be very careful when you install an SAP environment, especially with HANA. That makes it quite complicated, and if you do that, just Standard-wise, with uh, standard installation, it will take time to set up a, a very big HANA environment. And this is why Thomas kicked in and said, I'm yeah. going to automate this um, with multiple tries until he came up with the, with the Ansible idea. Yeah, that's so right. So I pass it over now to Thomas.
to yeah, talk thanks. about that. Yeah, my name is Thomas. I'm uh, from SVA, 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 and I'm working with Linux since uh, 20 years. And uh, at the moment, I um, automate uh, enterprise environments, and that's the point. I'm here uh, to show you the way I've uh, developed the automation process for the Sapana deployment with Sapana, uh, with uh, Ansible. And uh, one thing of uh, the Sapana database is that is, um, or one thing it's, yeah, not typical in the Linux environment is that uh, the Sapana database isn't, uh, app or isn't uh, published as an RPM package. So uh, SAP is uh, using a binary to install the complete Sapana database. And uh, this is only a command, but the point is uh, you had to do a lot of work before the installation of the Sapana database, and this um, configuration you had to done is uh, saved in SAP nodes. It's a documentation, and it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of documentation you have to do by your own, by, by hand, uh, to configure the system uh, until the state you can install the Sapana database in this case. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you had to um, use the sub nodes, and you had to enter every command or every uh, configuration which is described in the sub nodes. If you don't uh, configure this uh, as described in the sub nodes, SAP would say later uh, this system is not supported, and you can't uh, run. Or you have, you could have performance issues, and you can't, uh, you don't get a, a certificate that you can run Sapana on a productive environment. And so it's very important that you can use every point of the uh, subnotes of, of the documentation, but uh, there's a huge problem because the documentation is so splitted that you have to search a lot of uh, subnotes and uh, use every subnode in the environment to use uh, yeah, to configure the system, and you don't have uh, the complete overview what have you done, and when you are doing it manually, uh, you lost a, lo um, a lot of information, or you can lost uh, some subnodes, and in some cases, some customers were coming to me and uh, ask uh, when I've completely finished the system, is this subnode already included? And I saw the subnode for the first time because it was very special for this environment, and so I had to build up or do a lot of manual stuff in, uh, after the, the configuration and installation of the system. Um, here's an example, okay, uh, for, the, for one subnode. Uh, so here's described in the subnode that you, uh, what kernel version is the minimal requirement for an rail 7.4, for, uh, for example. And um, the subnodes uh, describe very strictly uh, what you need and what you have to configure on the whole environment. It's a good documentation. It's described what you have to do, but the uh, overview about all, all subnodes is very yeah, complicated, and uh, you lost the overview about every subnode you have to in uh, integrate in your system in this environment. Uh, so this is only as an example. Um, and here you have an overview what uh, subnodes are required for installation for Sapana database. Um, so one subnode is describing which operating systems are supported. So there uh, could be two versions of Sapana of the uh, Sapana database, uh, version one and two. And uh, when you are, um, use uh, one version, for example, one, you have uh, another um, supported operating systems as when you are using version two. And that's described in this uh, subnode, for example. Then you have a guideline subnode where you uh, where it's described how you to configure the whole, um, whole system uh, on the operating system. And uh, when you are using another architecture, uh, like IBM Power, you have to use uh, additional Sapana node for configuring the system or optimize the system for the uh, power uh, environment, and so on and so on. And one point is uh, the optimization of the network stack. So it's really exactly described what you have to do that the environment is uh, so optimized that Sapana is running on it uh, perfectly or nearly perfectly uh, for, the, um, yeah, for the use case. And, uh, yeah. and one interesting point is when you are using all the subnodes and uh, you have a virtual environment, you can throw it away and use uh, some other subnodes or some other documentation uh, because for a virtualization environment, uh, you have to do other settings in this case and another configuration. 
uh, for the Sapana database or for the installation for the Sapana database because it's uh, very performance optimized or performance, uh, yeah, it had to be very performance optimized the whole environment. So that's a short overview about, uh, uh, about the Sapana database. And uh, this is a process how it is, uh, how our database is built up uh, from the beginning to the end. And uh, one point is um, in the whole process, uh, some guys had to buy, uh, build up the whole hardware environment. So that's not one point of this presentation, but uh, it's very difficult, it's very complicated because you have uh, huge uh, servers which had to be configured uh, completely right. Uh, you have to do the cable management and so on. And uh, you have to um, yeah, configure the whole, whole hardware environment. And one point is where I started is the Linux configuration. So uh, the Linux uh, is uh, yeah, configured after the subnodes I mentioned before. It had to be configured after the subnodes I mentioned before. And you have to install this uh, Linux in, uh, system. You have to configure it. And normally, you give then the system to the SAP guys, and they will configure and install the Sapana environment. And that's some point uh, where a lot of information were lost. lost because in, sub, in some sub-nodes are described, you have to configure the network uh, correctly, and then uh, this stuff is done uh, or doing, or done by the, um, by the colleagues from the SAP team. And uh, sometimes I saw this before, or it's very often happened, uh, they would uh, configure like a network bonding and only put one interface in it because they don't know what exactly this is. And in the sub-node is only was described, you have to use uh, bonding interfaces. And uh, when I saw the systems later for the validation, I thought, oh my God, what had he done or what had done here before? And uh, to fix it later, and uh, it was uh, doubled work because uh, they don't uh, spoke with me or we don't uh, spoke with each other. And so a lot of information were lost and every time the work had uh, be doubled and done again and again. And, I, and that's what was one point I said, okay, that, that couldn't be, um, the, the future of my work, and um, then I started with an automation process. And the last point uh, is the maintenance. So you can, when you have a validation, validate system, a validated system, you can give it to the uh, yeah, maintenance or to the operating uh, guys, which uh, will uh, manage the whole system. So as described before, um, the whole process was done a lot of times uh, by manual work. It was four years ago when we got a project where we uh, had to start to build up a whole environment with uh, 47 uh, Sapana instances with uh, servers with uh, everyone had uh, two terabyte of memory. And we built it up in our building center because we had to deliver the complete system to the customer uh, at this point. And uh, I saw very quick, when we don't automate this environment with 47 servers, it's nearly impossible to deliver it to the, to the customer in uh, nearly three weeks because it was a time, uh, we, it was a, this was a fixed time. Um, and uh, it, when we don't do it uh, yeah, automatically, we don't, it's nearly impossible to, to uh, deliver the system on time. So um, I spoke with the SAP guys and uh, told them hey, we, had, we had to automate because uh, it's very important. And after uh, one hour, they said, okay, that's right, because uh, the work they had to do was a lot of work for this uh, environment because every server was uh, configured individually. So uh, I started with some configuration. I used Puppet in the first uh, point of view, or in the first configuration, to deliver one automatic system and uh, configured everything as it uh, was uh, needed for SAP in the first version, and um, it worked because uh, I, I spoke with the SAP guys. They told me you had to configure this, 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 and this. And uh, in the end of the deployment, uh, everything worked fine. Uh, the special thing was uh, the half of the data center, 24 servers, wasn't available at the end of the, or three days before delivery because um, the guys from the hardware uh, part were missing some uh, yeah, network cables and uh, power cables. So uh, <laughs> it's a typical thing. And um, 
the servers were available three days before delivery, and we uh, deployed with a Puppet configuration uh, uh, and uh, delivered or uh, installed uh, 24 systems within 20, uh, within, sorry, within four hours, because everything was pre-configured. The Puppet configuration was uh, configuring the whole system, and we had some additional uh, configuration for an automatic um, uh, installation method, uh, kickstart which had completely installed the systems as defined. So four hours for this mesh, uh, for this servers was very quick because with two uh, terabyte of memory, uh, it, the booting process uh, by itself is, uh, is going up to 15, 20 minutes because of the memory check. And so it was very uh, interesting because everything worked fine and worked perfectly. And the validation was uh, fine for the last 24 servers too because we have um, yeah, configured it with the, with the configuration management before and it worked very fine. On the other side, we only had uh, three weeks time and it was a very quick and dirty solution. I will show it here. We had uh, built up an, um, an Excel file where we input every configuration in it, and it was a long, long line for every server. And uh, we saved here every parameter. For example, uh, the sub SID, it's a parameter which is used in SAP HANA for the deployment process for every environment. And it's, it was a very uh, huge Excel file where every yeah, configuration was uh, saved. Then we converted it into CVS, and then from CVS to the, to the Puppet variables. And uh, it was very, very dirty, and nobody knows what I've done. And um, <laughs> it was very complicated in this. But at, at the end, it worked uh, very good, and every system was delivered as expected. So, um, in this case, I saw this is, very, this is a very cool solution. It's quick and dirty, and it, it was quick and dirty at this point, but it worked, and we have um, collected three points of the whole uh, installation process. Uh, Linux configuration, the so Sapana installation and configuration, and the validation of the system, because when the configuration management was uh, going on on the configuration and on the systems, uh, you know exactly every system was configured as expected. Um, I tell everyone uh, um, it is uh, working uh, nothing or no server or every server is working at the end of the environment. And it's very important because you have, uh, when you have a staging environment, I will uh, mention it later, um, you can test in your, in your test environment if everything is right and not. Uh, and if it's not right, you know it's not right. And you don't forget one parameter on one system. And that's the thing you can validate the systems because every run is, is, uh, right, is configured on the right side. And um, at this point, when I saw the, the advantages of the configuration management with Sapana, Installation types. I uh, yeah, I developed a solution which uh, is much more understandable in this way, and will be or could be used in a better way and other people's too, um, because um, um, it's very important to have, except uh, in this in this um, in this high performance environment that every server is configured on the right uh, is right configured. In this case and. One point is, yeah, it's an automation for the whole environment, and you, um, instead of three steps, you only add one step for the configuration management deployment, and uh, everything is working fine then. So uh, then, uh, as I told it before, I started with uh, Puppet, and uh, it was uh, a very huge uh, environment we have to, uh, had built up in the, in the last time, or in, the, in this uh, time where I've developed the first version. And I really uh, fast saw, okay, Puppet is a very complex environment because you need a server in every, uh, in, in every environment. And on every customer side, you have to install an administration server where if you uh, put on Puppet when the customer don't have Puppet. And um, then I thought, okay, it would be better when we will use uh, Ansible in this case. And... Um, it was uh, a very big advantage for Ansible that you have a very fast, um, very fast uh, starting process with Ansible, so you can introduce more people into the uh, into the automation process. And uh, my first thinking was, will I um, 
will I uh, maintain two projects, the Puppet project and the Ansible project. That was one thinking. I give up later uh, because it's a, it's a huge of work you have to do with, with one yeah, configuration uh, management in this case and later with the testing too. And um, so the thinking was when I will uh, manage two um, rep repositories for configuration management, um, I will use an easy way to uh, convert the Puppet configuration I've done with uh, uh, to Ansible. And I use some tools which will uh, convert the Puppet configuration to, to Ansible. Uh, I searched one or two days, but in the end I thought, okay, it's not a perfect tool who can do this. And um, I don't find anything which can convert automatically the complete environment, so I do it by myself, and then I uh, configured the whole uh, Puppet configuration in the first way uh, completely by myself in within three days to have a first Ansible playbook which uh, completely done the work of the, of the Puppet modules. And uh, here too, uh, it was nearly ununderstandable for others because it was a direct migration from Puppet, which were included with, uh, with bash scripts, a lot of bash scripts, and with a lot of uh, configuration tools. And uh, I had done it in the best uh, way I've uh, known it would work. And, um, but it was only wrote down and uh, the processes were, were, the configuration were done, but I never know which configuration I had made were mentioned in the sub notes later and the customers uh, were asking, okay, which, which sub note is, um, is uh, uh, which sub note is, uh, will be configured with, uh, with the Ansible playbook and if the sub note is, um, is uh, configured with, with Ansible. Uh, but at the end, it worked, and it was fine for the first step. So uh, here's some, some uh, basic example uh, how the configuration was uh, done with puppets. So uh, in the first step, when you uh, will start um, or stop uh, configuration services, uh, services from Linux, here uh, stop numa d. It's a, it's a thing it named in some sub node. Uh, to stop the service, to disable the service. In Puppet, you have to enter three uh, lines of code or four uh, with this. So it's a service. You define a service. You enable this uh, service, and you uh, ensure that the service is stopped. And so while I've uh, done it in three days, it was very easy to configure it in, in Ansible 2 because it's uh, from the configuration part, it's nearly the same. You, you disable the service and you uh, configure the service to be stopped. So that was um, the way uh, why it was possible to convert the whole Puppet environment within three days. The same uh, with uh, installation of packages, and uh, when you do it, uh, one uh, you convert it one to one. It's uh, yeah, it's very easy, but uh, as I mentioned before, unreadable for others, or ununderstandable for others. And yeah, uh, it's an example for for Ansible too. So um, then uh, I worked with Markus, Andreas mentioned before, Markus Koch. We worked very strong together and built up um, a way uh, to uh, understand the modules much more better. So we uh, used ready to uh, use roles from Red Hat, which were published uh, as uh, Linux system roles from Red Hat. This are uh, yeah, role definitions from Red Hat, which uh, will be I don't know, is, are they already uh, there published? There are 7, there will be in RHEL 8, and you can see them in Fedora as well. So they will publish from Reddit in the future, and uh, or it already already uh, published at the moment, and these are worlds which you can download or which are um, delivered with Red Hat by itself, and you can use it uh, like a network configuration and something like that. And um, yeah, we uh, then in the next step we uh, we um, we we, we uh, use the subnodes to see if every step in the subnode described in the subnode is uh, handled by the Ansible playbooks. And uh, we use some some first style guides to have a better understanding because we worked with two people uh, then on the project. Uh, that we know what exactly the other was done and uh, where it was done and how it was done. And um, 
re, uh, reused uh, the script uh, snippets I've mentioned before, which I wrote. Uh, we um, reused uh, this uh, script to, to install this HANA instance. It was historical. Uh, why I've done this this way, because in my mind was already okay, perhaps in the future I can uh, do uh, or ma maintain the Puppet and the Ansible uh, modules. But uh, the structure wasn't uh, much more better in this case, and uh, it was no way to for proper testing in the whole environment. So uh, we had the problem when Markus was uh, changing something, and uh, I would to deploy it. Um, I had to build up a whole test environment with a uh, small instance with a test environment. Uh, it's a minimum requirement with uh, 32 gigabyte of memory to have an installation for Zapana, and then I have to install the operating system and configure the network configuration, and then to play up the, the uh, or to start the Ansible playbooks, and it would be uh, a long time to configure it because Marcus was testing on his own environment, I was testing on my environment, and it was very difficult when he had done some uh, basic changes uh, that I would uh, test it on a, on a time or uh, in time because um, I had to build up the whole system uh, in this or clean up the uh, operating system or install a new operating system in an environment which has enough space. And um, this was something uh, a lot of time was lost because uh, when I done the changes, Marcus had the same problems because he couldn't test the whole environment. And so this, this was the first version with, which was uh, working, but uh, was uh, yeah, nearly impossible to maintain with, with uh, more than one people. So uh, we built up a process overview, what exactly is needed with the Sapana installation type. And uh, the first point is we need a basic environment set up, uh, something like the, um, conf uh, the, the subscription management, uh, something like third API, uh, or third, um, third party software repositories, which, which could be included in the whole environment to have, uh, um, to, have uh, to, to split up the Ansible playbooks or roles in this way to get a better understanding what we are doing and don't mix uh, the whole environment in the whole process. Because the playbooks I mentioned before were mixed with everything we thought it could be a thing of Sapana uh, part. That's one thing uh, I described in the basic OS setup because uh, we have done some network configuration in the playbooks and the roles. We have done the NTP configuration in the, in the uh, original nodes and uh, we enabled some, uh, some repositories in the nodes. And that was the problem. It was nearly ununderstandable for us by ourselves, by ourselves, because uh, you had done a lot of work which don't had to do with the Sapana deployment and don't had to do with the Sapana um, subnode. It was, wasn't described in the subnodes because uh, of the missing test environment. So. Uh, we split it in two parts, basic environment setup, basic setup, and the HANA installation and configuration part. And at this point, we focused on the HANA installation and configuration part because it was the main, in, main important part of it. And uh, that was the part uh, which the subnodes uh, were described exactly what to do and what had, we had to done. And um, yeah. Yeah, we split it in, uh, yeah two points, the HANA installation and configuration guide. One part was the OS, uh, the operating system uh, pre-configuration. So here's described everything you need for uh, configure a clear um, rail system for, the, uh, for operating a Sapana uh, system. So the so subnodes are describing the network configuration, for example, what services you had to start and so on. And uh, we split it in two parts because um, one, uh, one part of subnodes were describing a um, uh, part where when you are, um, yeah, need or when you will uh, install or prepare the system for a sub environment, what you had to done. And uh, the second one what was what you had to done when you are um, uh, using a Sapana pre-configuration for the system. And so we split it this in with two roles, and these are the two roles will, which will be supported in the future with the Linux system roles, and uh, which will be described the subnodes. Uh, here's one example for a subnode, uh, how to configure the whole environment. 
At the moment, I'm uh, developing uh, the other three parts, the HANA deployment, um, which will install the HANA uh, completely from, uh, to, until to the end. Um, and uh, I'm configuring at the moment uh, the Sapana system replication setup. That's on the configuration where you can build up uh, two Sapana um, uh, environments. You install two Sapana environments, and they will uh, interconnect to each other uh, for a uh, cluster configuration. And the last part is I'm developing at the moment is a pacemaker cluster setup that it uh, will automatically switch from one side to the other and um, yeah, will be used for an automatic uh, um, switch for Sapana environment. It's much more complicated as it sounds at the first point because with Sapana you have the possibility to um, build up scale-out environments, so very huge environments, environments for example, uh, for uh, scale-out environments, and you have every uh, scale-out environment uh, doubled in two, in two data centers, for example, and there's a lot of scurrying things when the uh, cluster, for example, can switch uh, from one data center to the other, so it's not possible. Um, okay, the cluster had to change now to the other data center and everything is working fine because the system replication, for example, should, uh, had, to be started, um, had to be started again and started uh, in a new way and it's, it's a complicated scurrying thing in the, in the pacemaker configuration. Um, so, um, to have a better overview what exactly uh, what exactly, um, what subnodes exactly needed for the Sapana pre-configure role? We uh, started with a process overview which uh, subnode is used in, on which uh, configuration state. And that was something it uh, bring us uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, it, it was possible for us to have a better overview what exactly we are doing and uh, to describe to our customers what exactly, uh, what subnodes will be uh, configured in the whole Ansible playbook or Ansible role. And uh, we uh, use the subnodes uh, yeah, as a process overview to, to show it to the customer and to ourselves uh, when which subnode should be used. And um, the first point is the operating systems. It's a playbook or a role, uh, it's a configuration in, in Ansible where we're checking if, uh, if the operating system is compatible with the Sapana version, which uh, should be installed. And uh, this is one interesting, uh, interesting feed, uh, yeah, role in this part, because the Sapana pre-configure part is uh, based on the subnodes, and it could be used by, um, by, by pure, pure Linux guys, because the whole system will be configured without knowing any configuration, you only need the Sapana version you will uh, need for, for the deployment, and the whole system will be uh, configured uh, without knowing something about Sapana because it's really the base and the pre-configuration for a complete HANA system. And um, this is some point uh, yeah, which is very interesting from this point of view. Um, then the next, uh, the next process part is uh, the, the repositories I mentioned before. We uh, change it in the, in, the, um, in the first step of the whole process overview, but uh, we are checking if the repository, uh, the files from the repository are available at this point. And then you see, as I mentioned before, too, uh, the power planning, uh, the configuration for a power system that you have to do uh, uh, another stuff for the configuration of a power system or as another subnode is using. And this is uh, a yeah, configuration in the puppet roles which uh, check if the system is a power system and use this sub-role configuration for this part. And then we have uh, different ways with, which uh, will be used if it's a Rails 7 system or a Rails 6 system and what had to be done. You see in this way for a Rails 6 uh, system, you have uh, three different nodes for six, uh, ah, okay, it's missing here. Uh, it's for 6.7, six, 6.6, six, six, and 6.5. Six, you have three different uh, subnodes, what you have to do when you have a 6.5 system, a 6.6 system, and so on. 
And for a uh, Rail 7 system, you have a subnode how to configure this configuration, and um, you have to uh, a subnode where you uh, what you have to done when you have applications or sub applications which were compiled with GCC, uh, GCC 7. You have to do uh, some. Uh, you have to create some links, for example, that everything is working fine, and you have to uh, to use this subnode too. And when you're finished with uh, subnodes from sub directly, uh, we have uh, included a Red Hat uh, recommendation um, part in the in the um, Ansible. Uh, configuration and these are the parts which uh, will be uh, done the system perfectly for running for Sapana because not everything is described in the subnodes. So uh, when you are not doing a, a basic um, installation for, for Red Hat, uh, they are missing, uh, it could be possible that you are missing some packages and these packages will uh, describe in the Red Hat recommendations. Uh, that, it, uh, that this packages will be installed and some uh, fine tuning from the operating system will be done in the Red Hat recommendation. And it's, an, yeah, it's based on the documentation from Red Hat by itself and uh, we don't find these configurations in the sub nodes. And then the process is finished and you have a complete uh, pre-configured system where the sub guys can start with the Sopana installation, for example. And... Um, that was a very interesting, uh, and that is uh, one point we started with, uh, with a process overview and used this with a combination of, uh, of better style guides we found. And one style guide we are using at this point is one from the Affinity Sys group, uh, which described exactly how you uh, had to build up the Ansible roles and you have to, um, the distinction uh, between the installation of packages, for example, and the configuration of the whole system. You have clear rules for the, for the variables, for the tags, and where you have to put information. And you have some guidelines for the documentation, for the documentation by the um, Ansible play, role and by the developing to the, uh, for the role. And this helped us a lot of, uh, uh, this helped us uh, so much and we uh, could uh, the f uh, work together the first time in the whole project and understand what the, the other one was uh, doing. And uh, with, this, uh, with this clear structure, we were, it was possible to um, include much more people in the whole uh, project to deliver code and uh, give us some information about this and extend uh, the project. Um, one point is, uh, yeah, I mentioned it before, the more granular role definition. So we have configured every subnode as a um, own file. I will show it in the next slide. And um, that was, was a very good thing because when a customer was asking, is this, this subnode configured with your Ansible configuration, we can show or look in this file and say, yes, you can um, see the configuration from the subnode is configured with this configuration file in Ansible and the customers were happy then. And the uh, uh, main point was, uh, which helped us to reorganize the whole uh, development process to build up a test environment in a cloud, or uh, to build up a test environment by itself. And uh, so we can see if some changes were made, if the whole installation process will be uh, done or will be finished uh, without errors and is working fine. And, uh, if something is uh, forgotten, uh, we're, we're not, uh, not mentioned, uh, we're not thinking about it. So uh, with the variable files, uh, here's an example. We put um, example files um, to the whole deployment process. This is an example file for uh, the configuration of, a, yeah, for the preparation of a whole system. Uh, the password is here in clear, but uh, when you are using a vault, it's, uh, it's not uh, a big problem. And the other part is this password is only for the installation process. You can change it later, and you have a complete installation, uh, you know, complete installation or pre preparation of your in, uh, environment. Uh, we are using, in this example, two roles, the Sapana uh, sub-base settings, the Sapana pre-configure settings, and the Sapana host agent. The Sapana host agent is, for example, um, uh, used for uh, the huge uh, scale-out environments for Sapana because you had to install Sapana host agent to configure the Sapana um, scale-out environment. And um, the next one is the directory structure. 
Uh, so we uh, used uh, the most, most important thing as the subnodes. As I mentioned before, I use this uh, configuration files and write down every subnode which uh, should be configured in this uh, in the subnodes. And this directory part was helping us to work uh, to work much more clearer with uh, with a complete uh, system role. Uh, and you see here the, um, under Red Hat 6 and under Red Hat 7 the recommendations uh, I've mentioned before and into, under subnodes the subnodes. And the one interesting point is the variable configuration. So we have built it uh, so clear that you have uh, the whole uh, configuration in the, in the main configuration file for the Ansible play, uh, role. And we only uh, change the variables for changes, for example, for minimal, uh, minimal requirement package uh, packages, uh, mini versions uh, you need, and this will be described in the VAS uh, configuration part of, of Ansible. And uh, here is some, some example for the subnode, which is describing uh, to install a TuneD uh, service, to configure the uh, TuneD service. And um, in the next slide, it's described how it is done with Ansible, so you can uh, very good um, uh, see, the diff uh, see what you have done in the Ansible, play in the Ansible configuration, uh, what you have uh, is described in the Sapana nodes for this example. And here you see uh, the configuration for the TuneD uh, daemon, which is enabled, and to apply the uh, TuneD profile. And for example, when you're using a VMware environment, that you have to use another, um, another profile uh, instead of the uh, normal uh, hardware environment, as I mentioned the one of the first slides. Uh, yeah, that's a different. Uh, uh, you see here the, the, the configuration on the one side and on the on the Ansible configuration part, and the same is um, an example for the network configuration. Uh, it's a little, uh, it's more explained what what we have done here or deeper in the system. So on the right side for the network configuration, SAP described what exactly parameters for the CTL you are using, and on the left side we are configured it with uh, Ansible playbooks. In this way. So um, the test pipeline I mentioned uh, before was a very important thing because uh, I started uh, some uh, month before with Terraform. It's an infrastructure as code software where I can uh, build up a whole environment in a cloud, uh, a private cloud, public cloud, wherever, um, to use it uh, to, to use uh, to build up test environments. It was very good because you can build up the environment, uh, you can destroy the, the environment, and it's very, uh, very interesting for, for, for development pipelines. And you have every time a fresh install system, so you don't have an install which were misconfigured or you don't know what exactly had to be done or was done on the system. And uh, you can start your Ansible playbooks every time to, this, uh, to, to fresh systems to see if, uh, if everything is working with a normal environment. And um, yeah, at the moment we are, we are planning to, uh, to integrate uh, Jenkins with our uh, test uh, development pipeline to see automatically what we have done or what is done with, uh, with, uh, um, with the whole system. And uh, for us, it was very important to use uh, the documentation for the automation we have learned um, in this uh, whole project because um, without the documentation, later you don't know what exactly uh, you have done in the, in the, Ansible, play, in the Ansible roles uh, or you can't uh, mention why you have done this uh, in this roles because uh, in the first steps or the first customer uh, um, questions were really why you are doing this and you, are, you doing, uh, are you configuring this after the subnotes or after the uh, documentation? And on the first version, we, don't, uh, couldn't say, uh, we couldn't say uh, uh, we had to look after it and to, uh, we look in every configuration file which was uh, deployed and see if the subnotes is already, um, already uh, yeah, configured on the system. And uh, yeah, build up everything from scratch was very interesting because you know it's a very clear installation and you don't have misconfigured something. 
uh, we never touched or uh, touching at the moment uh, systems when we're deploying it manually to do some changes on the systems. And very important is the version management because um, it helped us yeah, to, to have uh, the actually a version of the whole environment. And one point was the staging um, of, the, uh, of the environment. So when you use a dev QR and um, test environment, um, you can test uh, everything uh, before, the, yeah, before you uh, deploy the whole environment uh, or to, to deploy the Ansible roads and see if everything is working. And this hel helped me, uh, as a customer example, to build up a very huge uh, Sapana environment on a, um, on a yeah, solution center or a test center, for example, to, uh, you to clone a, a complete uh, environment which wasn't built up by uh, automatic Ansible playbooks, uh, but uh, I got the data from the customer and it was possible for me in the cloud environment to build up exactly the, the, the environment with uh, 36 nodes uh, with a smaller environment uh, which each had only uh, 32 gigabyte of memory um, and help the customer to uh, test his cluster environment and see what exactly the whole environment is doing. And that was very easy with the uh, automation process with the Ansible playbooks and uh, with the configuration of this environment. And helped us because I only had, uh, I had to fill up some, um, some variables in the, config in the, pub in the Ansible uh, playbook and the configuration was finished and exactly cloned the environment. Yeah, and at the moment I'm building up, uh, I mentioned before, a complete Sapana scale-out system, uh, scale-out system with system replication and a pacemaker configuration, and, uh, and using this uh, the Ansible playbooks, um, and uh, it helped me uh, a lot of much to speed up my, my work because uh, it was possible within one hour to build up a complete environment, and with the cluster configuration you can, uh, when you have configure too much on the system and touch too, uh, too much to the system for the test and something were broken, uh, you don't think, oh, how ha could I repair it? Uh, you only throw away the whole environment and install it new, and with this environment, you are finished with one hour, for example. And one point is uh, we have uh, I've switched it um, with public roles and custom roles. The public roles are roles we are publishing at the moment on GitHub, and the custom roles are roles which are directly uh, for the customer environment, like uh, host configuration, network configuration, local, host, uh, local disk configuration, satellite connections. Um, these are things uh, which uh, are used by the, um, yeah, uh, which change from, every, uh, from customer to customer in this case. And yeah, that was a short overview about the um, standardi standardizing uh, the Sapana, uh, complex IP uh, environments with Sapana uh, for this example. Any questions? Just a second. Yeah. Uh, wait. Just a second. Who wants to? So uh, the first question is, uh, so your overview was in BPM, so you, uh, the actual uh, flow of how you're deploying the thing, yeah. and I saw in the actual files, you, you basically just put them separately. Um, it seemed to me as the steps are were different files depending okay. on whatever. Do you basically just do ifs in there, and how do you map them like we visually? Are, yeah, uh, the question was uh, how we. Um... <laughs> I said it, so it's recorded. Probably. Okay, uh, so um, uh, we included the configuration in the uh, in the main configuration file, and it's included like the BPMN overview. So uh, we have uh, worked with uh, if question, uh, with if um, statements and include the files uh, after the row. So uh, when you're using it, it's based on the BPMN overview. Okay, and the second question is, how is the configuration looking now? I would assume Puppet also has some sort of inheritance and kind of structuring of the configuration. I don't know Puppet, but I would mm -hmm. assume. So I don't understand how can it would have become better, the configuration, right, from the huge Excel to your current setup, how would it look now? Oh, sorry, can you repeat? So you had previously, you said a huge problem of Puppet was you had this huge Excel file where you configure everything, yep. right, a bunch of variables. Now I would assume 
Puppet has a way of managing configurations, yeah. right? I don't know Puppet, yeah. but I would assume. That, that's right. Uh, the configuration with Puppet, um, that was the first version with the, with the Excel file, and we have uh, split it up later uh, to the, to the uh, Puppet configuration directly because it was only example for the first, uh, for the first part of it. Okay. So, in the back. Oh. All the way up. <laughs> Um, the question was if we are using modules uh, for the deployment or if we are just uh, used commands. And um, here it's uh, the system uh, role definition. We don't use modules at this point. We only use the definition which are described in the subnodes. And we are using uh, some, uh, some direct uh, shell scripts which are used uh, to uh, start the deployment process in this way. Okay. Thank you. And a second question, how did you ensure the, the roles are uh, idempotent? Could you rerun the whole setup? Um, or did you need, do you need to destroy it before you rerun the setup? Yeah. In this case, uh, it's not possible to change uh, any. Uh, when you are installed in Sapana system, we are only checking if the system is installed. And uh, is, uh, if the system is installed, uh, the installer didn't, uh, will not install it uh, a second time. So we only had to check uh, for the installation process, and it, um, um, it uh, will uh, watch over if the installation was already done with the configuration of some Sapana parameters you can get with effects. Okay, but, but then it could happen that some administrator changes something that's no longer compliant with the sub nodes, and, and you run into troubles in the end when you want to uh, ensure that the system is set up in the right, uh, how it should be re regarding the SAP nodes. You know what I mean? Um, how could you ensure that nobody makes manual changes? Um, yeah, the, the point I was uh, described before, it was only the installation. So it's only checking if the installation was done. Uh, and uh, all other parts, like is, uh, with, uh, the pre-configuration of the system, like uh, configuration of the network part, is uh, doing with the Ansible uh, playbooks. So there are uh, some parts which only uh, checks the uh, Sapana installation, um, because it's only the installation process. It's not the management of the, of the Sapana environment. Thank you. Okay. So we don't have time? Yeah. There's one more. Why are you guys spread up? It's very fast. <laughs> just wanted to make a comment to your question, which you just had. Uh, so I'm working actually with a team at SAP Waldorf on our uh, efforts targeting SAP. And your question is pointing into a different project we are working on, which are the inside rules, where we also have sp uh, SAP specific rules which when test for the content of the SAP nodes. So if you want to make sure that the systems remain consistent with those SAP nodes, the insight um, would be able to do that for you. And then from a Red Hat point of view, we use insights for those who are familiar with the insights service uh, that would check your systems and they would check them with the SAP nodes once they're all in the insights database. And once you have that, if your system would violate what we have in the insights database, the insights service would give you an Ansible uh, playbook to correct that. Uh -huh. But this, this is the okay. installation and the maintenance is something else. Okay. That was all. Yeah, thanks.